glad you all made it this morning. My name is Suzanne Dorsey, and I'm the executive director of the Harry R. Hughes Center for Agroecology. And um, we're so glad to have you here at Chesapeake College today. Um, I'm new to my position, well, about seven or eight months into it. Um, but I, I am aware of the Poultry 101 Symposium. This is an event that's been several years in the planning. Um, initially, as I understand it, four Hughes Center board members suggested convening a small group of people to come together from the poultry industry, the environmental organizations, and the Hughes Center to discuss issues surrounding poultry. As a result, this symposium came into being. So I want to thank all of our Hughes Center board members who have supported this idea and um, made sure that this actually came to pass. So if you are a Hughes Center board member, if you could please rise and be recognized. Thank you very much. The event was led by a steering committee who made the decisions about how this was, uh, this uh, 101 was going to be run and come together and the topics that were relevant. So I'd also like the steering committee members to stand and be recognized. If you're a steering committee member, please rise. Finally, we've received funding and support from the Maryland Council, uh, the Rural Maryland Council. Um, they helped to underwrite this event through a MEREDF grant. And we want to encourage all of you to, to visit the, Maryland, the Rural Maryland Council's website and learn more about funding opportunities. Um, Nancy Nunn, as many of you know, is really the key leader in making sure this meeting came together. So Nancy's standing there at the back, um, but I do want to recognize Nancy's many hours of effort making this come together. Thank you, Nancy, for all of your work. So a few housekeeping um, uh, things to take care of before we start. Um, silence your phones uh, if you need that reminder. And you received several note cards during registration. Please write your questions on the note cards, and we'll collect those questions during each session. If you need ad additional note cards, we will be handing them out throughout each session. Um, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. As I told you, if you registered, make them funny. Let's have a good time. Um, finally, this meeting is, the purpose is educational. And a lot of you come at this issue from a number of different perspectives, environmental, uh, industry leaders. So our purpose here is really to, to listen to each other and to find that consensus win-win scenario that allows everybody to be successful. So let's make sure that we're respectful of other people's opinions, where they're coming from, um, and be willing to really listen and learn from each other. I think that's going to result in the best uh, outcomes of this meeting. So, so thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, being a part of this and, and being an active member. I do want to introduce our first session's facilitator, Errol Maddox. Errol is a Hughes Center board member and a farm specialist for University of Maryland Eastern Shore Extension. Come on up, Errol. As uh, Suzanne said, um, my name is Errol Maddox. I'm um, down at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. I'm working in the Small Farm Outreach Cook Program. And I'm honored to uh, facilitate this session. Uh, Bill Satterfield, I've known for quite a while, as well as uh, Jennifer Timmons. And I'm sure you will uh, be impressed, to say the least, by the presentations. So Bill and Jennifer, come on up. Bill's going to share some insights from uh, DPI's perspective. Good morning, everybody. Poultry 101. So I'm the introducer of what's going to happen today, I think. What I want to do is spend a few minutes talking about how the industry is structured, how things are done, how things are not done, talk to you about uh, uh, trends in the industry and take you on a little visual tour of the industry so the presentations and discussions later in the day might have a little bit more relevancy once you know how the industry operates and a lot of you do and for those of you who do if you want to go out and get some more breakfast fine come back when Jennifer comes in but uh, we're going to start off with uh, a few photographs and go from there and this is a photograph of Mrs. Wilmer Steele of Ocean View, Delaware, who quite by mistake got this industry started in 1923 when she ordered 50 replacement chicks 
for the production of eggs. She got 500. She made money. She continued. Her neighbor saw she was making money. And the meat chicken industry that we have today is a result of an accidental delivery of 450 extra chicks. Small houses back then, weren't they? These are some houses under construction. You can see how the technology has changed. This is a modern chicken house in western Wicomico County. We have five chicken companies operating on the Delmarva Peninsula. Some of them you may have heard of, some of them you may not have heard of. Some have a branded product, some do not. A Little bit about each company. Uh, Allen Harem is the newest company on Delmarva. It took half of the assets of the family-owned Delaware business, Allen Family Foods, that filed for bankruptcy in 2010 and bought them and is operating now uh, as the uh, 21st largest chicken company in the United States. It's a Korean-owned company. Its headquarters is Seaford, Delaware. Amic Farms is headquartered in South Carolina. It's part of a bigger meat company, an international meat company called, known as OSI. It took the first half of Allen's that was voluntarily put up for sale a few years prior to the bankruptcy. AMIC does not have a branded product as far as I know, but it does have the contract for the Sam's Club store brand. And you can look at each poultry product on the store shelves and see a USDA number, a P and then number two or three or 517 or whatever, that identifies where that chicken was slaughtered and processed. So I just happened to look one day when I was at Sam's Club and that was AMIC. Mount Air Farms is the seventh biggest chicken company in the United States with operations on Delmarva and North Carolina. It's a family-owned company owned by a gentleman named Ronnie Cameron from Arkansas. Purdue Farms, founded in 1920 in Salisbury by Mr. Arthur W. Purdue. His son Frank Purdue took over and now uh, his grandson Jim Purdue is the uh, chairman of the board and it is the uh, fourth biggest chicken company in the United States. And the number one chicken company in America is Tyson Foods, which is more than chickens anymore. It's one of the largest meat companies in the world and is acquiring new companies and getting into new lines every year. Uh, while Tyson is the largest in the United States, it is not the largest on the Delmarva Peninsula. It operates mostly in the southern portion of the peninsula, Accomack County, and some of the three uh, or four lower shore counties in Maryland, and has a few growers in Delaware. Well, the chicken industry is a voluntary relationship between willing partners. Uh, the five chicken companies I just mentioned, the 1,600 or so family farms that grow the chickens, and they divvy up the responsibilities. The companies own the birds. The companies have uh, the responsibility of owning the birds, getting them from the primary breeders into the hatcheries, delivered to the family farms, uh, they provide the feed, they formulate the feed, uh, they provide generally the bedding material that's used in the chicken houses on the floor, the wooden bedding material. Uh, they provide the health care programs. That's not something the growers make decisions on. The uh, chicken companies uh, provide advice to the farmers on how to grow the birds to meet the company's expectations. The chicken companies catch the birds at the end of the grow-out cycle, transport them to the processing plants where they are processed, and then are responsible also for marketing and sales. The growers own the land. They own the chicken houses. They own the equipment in the chicken houses. They provide the day-to-day -day management of the farms. The growers pay the electric bill, which is one of the biggest costs the growers have. And the growers own the manure, the litter, which for many growers is a valuable byproduct. It has value as a fertilizer, perhaps for that farm, or it can be sold to another farm and it's extra income for the chicken farm. And the panel of growers following Jennifer's presentation is going to talk about more in detail some of their responsibilities. This is, a, this is an industry of family farms. These are not corporate owned farms. Well, they could be from a tax structure, but they're family-owned businesses, whether they're an LLC, a partnership, sole proprietorship, or a corporation. And these are some of the outstanding growers we've had in recent years. This guy moved from Long Island to open up his farm near Salisbury. Got tired of being a limousine driver up there. He and his son now operate the farm with eight houses near Salisbury. 
Two outstanding growers we honored this year, also near Salisbury, husband and wife. His father is in the chicken growing business. This is a family near uh, Harrington, again one of our outstanding growers. The entire family is involved. These are outstanding growers who came to the area about 10 years ago, got tired of the rat race in the big city and decided they wanted to grow chickens. They grow near Laurel, Delaware. And this is a family that had been in farming but just went into chickens a few years ago west of Wyoming, Delaware. So it is a family business. A family today can take care of six, eight, ten houses, maybe with one hired person, but these are not factories. These are not mega farms, as critics would let you believe or make you hope you would believe. They're family farms in the truest sense of the word. So the industry is like a three-legged stool. We have the family farms that grow the chickens, the five chicken companies, and the people who grow the corn and the soybeans that are fed to the chickens. Corn is about 60% of the diet, soybeans about 20%, and each segment of the stool depends upon the other. Without a strong grower base for growing the birds, there's no need for the grain farmers. There'd be very few grain farmers or soybean farmers on Delmarva if the chicken industry was not here. If the chicken companies didn't have the growers, they would not be here. If the growers did not have the chicken companies, they would not be here. And we're unique in Delmarva in many respects that there are five chicken companies operating in this region. In some parts of the United States, there may only be one or two chicken companies, but around here we have five. When I started with DPI many years ago, there were 12 companies, and before that there were many, many more. But we're at five, we've been at five since the Allen Harem acquisition of the uh, old Allen facilities. So let's take a visual tour of the industry. These are the girls that lay the eggs that become the meat we eat. These breeder farms are not too numerous on the Delmarva Peninsula. There are about 12 operated by just one company. There used to be many more breeder farms on Delmarva, but they moved, they closed. The companies decided they didn't want to have their breeder farms on Delmarva with the broiders. It takes a lot of work to grow these birds. There's no two week, three week break every eight or nine weeks as there is with broilers. This is a more than year round full time business when those birds are laying the eggs. So the birds lay the eggs. Another picture of a breeder farm. You can, you can see they're not in cages. They have free roam of the house. Unlimited water, unlimited feed, fresh air, pretty good life. So those eggs are then collected by the chicken companies and taken to the hatchery. They're put in the incubators and there for 21 days, they get the proper heat, the proper ventilation, the proper humidity and they are rotated. Those racks rotate back and forth slowly to simulate the movement of the egg had, had it been under a hen. And this is what comes out when the eggs crack open and the day, day one chicks are now there. They're vaccinated under the company's vaccine program, prepared for market, prepared for delivery to the chicken houses and they're delivered the day they are hatched at the hatcheries. Each hatchery is owned by the chicken company. The chicken company owns the hatchery, it owns the feed mill, it owns the processing plants, it's a vertically integrated industry. So the day old chicks are taken out to farms like this, where they are raised, again, without cages, free roam of the house, the grower's top job is to provide a good environment for those birds. Animal welfare is a key component of the growing of the birds. These are the nipple drinkers, those yellow things you see. It's kind of like a water fountain. The bird goes up, tips it, the water falls into him. An innovation that began about 20 years ago, and it's been a great innovation. Improvements galore in avian health because there used to be open troughs and the water would get dirty and nasty and the birds would drink it, the nipple drinkers came along, it cleaned up the water supply, it reduced the amount of moisture in the house, the amount of moisture falling on the bedding material, and thus reduced the amount of manure and hardened litter that needed to be cleaned out. Another picture of the birds at the nipple drinker. Unlimited feed. The diet of the chicken changes. It's different from company to company. It's different depending upon the age of the bird. It's not the same diet for the whole eight, nine, ten weeks, whatever the growing program is. 
So the birds get the feed in the, the tanks at the outside of the farm is where it's held. There are replenishments when necessary. Unlimited supply of feed for those birds. Just a long range view of the chickens. Ventilation, environmental control, top priorities for the growers. Again, no cages. Well, keeping the birds healthy is a, a big job of the growers. Whether that's routine health maintenance in cooperation with the companies which provide the health care products and the advice, or dealing with situations where we may have an emergency poultry disease such as avian influenza come in. So keeping visitors out of chicken houses is to protect the birds, not to protect the visitors. And we encourage growers to post signs such as this to limit entry to the houses only to necessary people and to keep logs of who's gone in the house, who they are, when they were there. So if there is a disease problem, there can be tracebacks to figure out did that person have anything to do with the transmittal of the virus or the bacteria from farm to farm. Just another reminder about biosecurity, needing to keep visitors to a minimum. A big U.S. Department of Agriculture priority is keeping the birds healthy. Because when there are sick birds, particularly with diseases like avian influenza, it can shut off exports to many countries who only need an excuse to cut off the importation of American poultry products. We had a meeting yesterday, as a matter of fact, dealing with prevention of avian influenza and having plans, better plans in place, should we have an episode on the Delmarva Peninsula. And if people go into houses, they should be suited up in biosecurity clothing. The growers in the black shirt, two visitors in the uh, biosecurity clothing that will be left on the farm and not be moved to another farm. So we continue the tour with a feed mill. The feed ingredients are brought in. They're mixed by the company to the company specifications and then transported in tanker trucks to the farms. These are the tanks that hold the feed. There used to be a way to see how much feed was in the tank and that was sort of throw a golf ball at it. And where it pinged, that told you how much feed was in it. I don't know if that's still a scientifically valid way or not, but I guess it still works. Sometimes they do get empty too soon. This is the processing plant. There's a bird by bird inspection by U.S. Department of Agriculture and by company quality control persons. And Jennifer will talk a little bit about the food safety aspects in our industry. Clean, sanitary, well lit. A lot of people have been at a lot of these plants for a number of years. Good pay, good benefits, steady employment. A lot of cut up work. Used to be chickens were sold as whole birds. Now very few are. A lot of cut up products and a lot of further processed products to make it a uh, product friendly to consumers. Again, you can see the, a, a bigger view of the plant, the cleanliness, the engineering wonders of these plants is something else. It takes a lot of work to make sure those lines flow smoothly. This is the USDA seal of inspection for wholesomeness, and this is plant number 007. I'm not sure where that is. 003 is Millsboro, Delaware. That was the Townsend's plant, one of the pioneers and the first vertically integrated chicken company in the United States, Townsend's, which is now part of Mount Air. So we produce products, variety of products. Chicken consumption is the top meat consumption in America, it's about 90 pounds per person, and finding new ways to get more people to eat more chicken is always a goal of people in the chicken industry. Don't sell many whole birds anymore. Well, one thing we do not feed the chickens is hormones. No hormones are added to commercial chicken feed. It is illegal. It has been illegal since Dwight Eisenhower was president. But yet the myth continues, and we're baffled. People ask, well, why do you give them hormones? Well, time out, we don't. But that myth just keeps getting perpetuated and perpetuating, and we just don't know how to stop it. So ladies and gentlemen, if you remember nothing else from my presentation or what you learned today, please remember that no hormones are added to the chicken's diets. Illegal. There'll be a quiz on this in a few minutes. Well, let's do the quiz now. What do we not add to chicken's diet? Hormones. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. All right. We've got a bright group here, Errol. 
bright group. So where are Delmarva products sold? Most sold in the Northeast United States and in the Mid-Atlantic States. However, exports are important. We estimate that about 20% of the Delmarva product is exported, which is in line with the percentage nationally. It's generally the dark meat and the paws, the chicken feet, and exports to Delmarva go to more than 100 countries. When I saw that number, I was a little bit surprised that it was such a, a long list. Each year, we collect data from the chicken companies at the end of the year to ask, tell us how many growers you had at the end of the year, number of birds raised, value of this, value of that, how many employees, and here are some of the data from a few months ago at the end of 2016. The Delmarva Peninsula grew 586 million birds, a steady growth. We're not, we're not seeing huge increases, we're not seeing huge declines. It's been at that plateau for a number of years. Those birds weighed 3.9 billion pounds. 1,600 farm families used to raise those birds. The chicken companies just on Delmarva had nearly 15,000 employees. Feed is the biggest cost of producing the bird, and it costs more than $1 billion in feed. So go back to the three-legged stool and you can see the importance to the grain source farmers and the soybean farmers of the local chicken industry. A lot of money spent to keep facilities current, and this is just $103 million of what the company spent on Delmarva. It does not include money spent by the growers for new houses or uh, housing upgrades. And as the products left the processing plant last year, they were valued at $3.3 billion. When you think of the small size of this peninsula and the small population, that's a lot of money circulating because of the chicken industry, circulating many times to the farmers, to the equipment providers, to the surveyors, to the bankers, to the restaurants, to the motion picture theaters, to everybody. So it's an important industry economically for Delmarva. This shows the state rankings of Delaware, Maryland, and the entirety of Virginia. On the Eastern Shore, we only have one Eastern Shore County growing chickens at Zacamac County. But if you look across the top line, the number of birds produced, Maryland was eighth in the country, Delaware 11th, Virginia 10th. If you look at pounds, Maryland 10, Delaware 8, Virginia 11, and the value of the birds, 10, 8, and 11. So we're all about the same size, the entirety of Virginia, the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and the state of Delaware. This is a chart that shows the number of chicken houses on Delmarva, starting in 1996 on the far left side to 2016, and you can see there are fewer chicken houses operating on Delmarva. That may surprise you because there has been a lot of construction in recent years, but that is replacing a lot of housing that has gone out of production. This shows the number of growers. Back in 1971, there were 3,500 farm families growing the chickens. That's now down to about 1,600. The capacity, if all the houses at one time were filled to their capacity, this would be it. And it's uh, about 120 million birds. And you can see the peak came in 2006 and has gone down a little bit in each of the, 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 the five-year intervals, intervals since then. Number of birds produced, we plateaued in 1996, and it's been kind of steady since then. Pounds of meat, that has gone up because we, are, we have heavier birds because of nutrition, better environmental conditions in the chicken houses, genetics, but no hormones, right? No hormones, okay, you're paying attention. So why so much construction recently? Well, for, for a number of years, it was regulatory uncertainty as the state of Maryland, the Department of the Environment, was considering stormwater management programs. Programs to capture clean rainwater. And there was uncertainty about what would be required of the grower, so why would you make an investment if you didn't know what the rules were? In 2010, 11, and 12, desperate times for the chicken industry nationally. Grain prices went through the roof. Corn, which had been maybe at $4 a bushel on Delmarva, rose to $12. Soybeans went from $6 to $7 up to $13 or $14 a bushel. And chicken prices for the companies were not getting any higher. Consumers were not paying more. So we lost 12 companies in the United States in those years, including two on the Delmarva Peninsula, Allen Family Foods and Townsend's Incorporated. There was a big housing boom in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Those houses are now 40 years old. They've outlived their usefulness, so they're going out of business or have gone out of business, and thus new housing is needed to replace the old housing. 
Interest rates have been good. People could borrow money, still pay their bills, and have chicken houses built. And the chicken companies offer an incentive to get the capacity they needed to operate their facilities, their processing plants competitively. And with the move toward organic production and the fewer use of antibiotics, more space per bird is needed. So those growing programs mean you cannot put as many birds in a house as before, thus you need new housing to grow the birds that are required. This is a recap of the annual feed bill. You can see it spikes once in a while depending upon grain prices. This shows the corn and soybeans used. Corn is the yellow line. Uh, we use about 80 million bushels of corn and about 30 some million bushels of soybeans every year. And we do not grow enough corn on this peninsula. A lot of it is brought in from other areas. Per capita consumption grew quite steadily for a number of decades and has leveled off. And this is the badge we have for, for people who support our chicken industry. And I'm going to make one shameless promotion here, Errol, if you'll give me one more minute. Okay, one minute. One minute. Two years ago, we were approached by a documentary filmmaker in Wilmington who wanted to do a video, really, on, on the, 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 the Russian Jewish influence on Delmarva's chicken industry. And a lot of the early processing plants in the 1930s were owned by Jews via Russia who lived in New York City. And they wanted to come to Delmarva and get chickens and process chickens. Well, the documentary maker, he kept talking to people, and he, people would say, well, you need to talk to this guy, and you need to talk to that guy, and he interviewed like 80 people, as it turned out, and came up with a much more thorough documentation of the early years of the chicken industry called Cluck, Cluck, and Luck, the improbable early history of Delmarva's chicken industry. It's an excellent video, professionally done. It's one hour in length, and today, and today only. We have, yes, today and today only. <laughs> We have them for sale for $20 a copy, which is what we paid for them. So if you're interested in the more history of the industry, see me, and we'll be happy to sell it to you. So I thank you for your attentiveness, and I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer, who's going to come cover some of the things that I did not talk about. So thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm Jennifer Timmons. I uh, teach at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Um, they're, I'm in charge of their poultry program, and I also do um, research with broilers at UMES. So I'm going to try to pick up on what Bill had um, introduced as far as the industry. And one thing he talked about, he talked about the progression in the industry, how things have changed as far as management, housing has changed, the bird has changed, diets have changed, and as a result, those birds have become extremely efficient in gaining weight, much quicker than they did. Um, for example, in 1925, it took them an average of 112 days to reach an average weight of two and a half pounds. And now, uh, this, this research is from the National Chicken Council. In 2011, it takes us less than um, 49 days, so it's 47 days to reach an average weight of 5.8 pounds. And as far as feed efficiency, now feed efficiency, now Bill mentioned feed is the number one cost in growing broilers. It's the number one cost in growing in animals in general. Feed efficiency has improved significantly, and what feed efficiency is, is basically the amount of feed it takes to get one pound of body weight gain. So, so essentially if we have a two, as a 2.0 as a feed efficiency, it took two pounds to get one pound of body weight. So as far as broilers, broilers are probably one of the most efficient animals in converting their nutrients into body weight. They have less than a two um, feed conversion. On average, is about in, 19, in 2011, they had a 1.91 a feed efficiency compared to 1925, 4.70 feed efficiency. And if we operated like that today, we would go out of business. So, and that's all due to the hormones we feed chickens, right? No. See, I'm, I'm helping you, Bill. So, technic, and a lot of people think, okay, how can you make this, this, this significant improvements in weight gain and feed efficiency. How can they grow so quickly in such a short amount of time? Well, what I tell my poultry class, there are two characteristics of chickens that make, that have allowed geneticists to select birds on improve on body weight gain and feed efficiency. First of all, chickens reach maturity at about 20 weeks of age. So they can start producing offspring very early and their second characteristic is they can produce an offspring, essentially 
they can lay one egg a day, about every 25 hours, they can lay an egg. So there is a lot of offspring to select from to improve their efficiency. So they can constantly select those broilers, um, those broiler, those offsprings to improve weight gain, feed efficiency, looking at mortality. Because you compare that to the beef industry, what it takes a cow, she takes about two years to reach maturity, and you're only going to get one calf. So that's why the um, broiler industry has been so um, efficient in improving weight gain and feed efficiency simply because the characteristics of broilers. Now, just talking about some um, environmental issues that um, broiler producers have implemented to improve the environment, to improve water quality. First, we have this program is the Environmental Buffer Program, and that's probably been in effect at least 15 years, Bill, probably. So, and essentially, the environmental buffer program is basically where trees and grasses, they are planted around the perimeter of the chicken house, around the fans, to catch dust that are exhausted from the poultry houses. That also improves water quality, because obviously those, those plants are going to um, take, uptake nutrients from the soil. And they look pretty around chicken houses. And sometimes I think they were, I think this program became initially just kind of to hide the chicken houses from, from individuals, especially around um, residential areas where they would, uh, some people would call them an eyesore, which I do not think. I think chicken houses are, are very pretty. But they, this vegetative environmental buffer program, the research has shown that they will improve water quality. They can uptake nutrients from the soil. It can collect dust, reduce the dust emissions from the fans. So this program has been very effective and a lot of um, uh, producers have taken advantage of that. This is just another picture of some of the um, vegetative environmental buffers that have been planted. Another picture as well. And I don't have time, but I just um, saw that was posted on, um, from DPI was, uh, I believe it was in Delaware, there was a farm through um, Jim Passwaters who was in charge of the vegetative environmental buffer program. They were able to plant a bee-friendly buffer to attract bees, they, so they planted different um, plants that were going to attract bees for, for pollination, which I, I have the link, but we're not going to, I won't share, maybe we could share it at the break if Jenny wanted to share it, but uh, I know we're short, we're going to be short on time. So vegetative environmental uh, buffers is one of uh, an environmental program that are implemented by poultry growers. Um, these heavy use area pads, these are um, just um, concrete pads that are installed at the end of the chicken house, simply to make it easier to collect the manure that comes out of the house. The only time manure is going to come out of the house is when they are catching the birds. They're going to be caught on the, the tires of the forklift when, um, and, and when they're cleaning out. So it just makes it easier for the grower at the end of this time to clean the pads off, collect the manure so that doesn't um, potentially um, run off. Some other environmental practices that are in place is um, there are nutrient management plans that all farmers in Maryland must have a nutrient management plan. And what two nutrients that we are concerned about are nitrogen and phosphorus. So essentially, they are going to manage um, those two nutrients um, um, coming into their farm or going, leaving their farm. There are some mortality and litter management regulations that um, poultry growers must implement as well. They go through some certifications and training to manage that. And there's also the Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation Program, which I'm just going to bring, this is the last time I'm going to bring that up because we'll, we're going to run out of time as far as the CAFOs. But as far as nutrient management, nutrient management has probably been in effect since 1996, I believe. And essentially, in a nutshell, what nutrient management plan, what they are doing is they are, you're managing the nitrogen and phosphorus that is coming onto the farm or leaving the farm. So essentially, some, there is a farmer's going to, if they're growing corn or soybeans, for example, they're going to have a nutrient management plan to grow those crops. So they are only allowed or permitted to apply the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that is needed by those crops. They are not, going, they are not permitted to um, apply any excess nutrients, per se. So that's essentially what a nutrient management plan is. And as far as poultry growers on Delmarva, they are going to fit the requirement as, of having a nutrient management plan. Technically, you must have a nutrient management plan if you have eight or more animal units. And an animal unit is defined as 1,000 pounds. 
or if the farm has a gross income of $2,500. But as far as um, the, any broiler producer, they're gonna be required to have a nutrient management plan. So essentially, like I said, what a nutrient management plan is, you're gonna take a soil analysis, so you're gonna find out what nutrients you already have in the soil, so you know um, how much you're going to need to apply. Just a general description of the farm, how many acres are you, um, does the farm have, how many crops, um, how many acres of corn do you plan to grow, how many acres of soybeans do you plan to grow, um, the amount of manure that is generated on the farm, so as far as broiler farms, they have to de determine how, many, how much manure is gonna be generated on an annual basis, So, because those are the two nutrients that we're gonna be worried about is nitrogen and phosphorus, and um, then they're gonna be given a fertilizer recommendation about basically how much nitrogen they're gonna be allowed to apply, how much phosphorus they're gonna be allowed to apply, and record keeping. All of this, as we all know, when we're, as far as regulations, record keeping is going to be essential because if it's not written down, it technically didn't happen. So you have to basically document um, all of these variables, get your, um, as far as your soil analysis, document how much manure was generated and where you sent that manure. So you have to write down, you know, who you sent, if you sent it to a farmer down the road, you have to document how many tons were sent to that farmer down the road. And essentially that farmer down the road is gonna have a nutrient management plan and they're gonna document that as well. So as far as broiler production, it's gonna include how, much pot how, ma how many animals are grown on the farm. So it's gonna include the number of um, broilers that are grown on the farm, and essentially, basically managing the litter. Where, where does the manure ultimately end up once it leaves the house? And they're given, as far as the nutrient management plan, includes litter application rates, how much litter they need to apply um, per acre on, the fa on their crops, if they're growing crops, and again, records of where the manure was sent. So they have to document um, who came in and collected their manure, how many tons did they take, the date, um, the date that it was collected, and basically the ultimate destination of that manure. Certifications, um, farm, poultry growers have to, they are, can have certifications that are gonna be required if they spread litter or compost on more than 10 acres per year. So they have to get a certification from the Maryland Department of Agriculture, if they're spreading this. And there are also composting certification courses that are, gonna, that are offered by the University of Maryland Extension to teach growers how to compost their, um, their dead poultry that, that um, exit the poultry house. So this is a, um, a composter. In animal agriculture, we are going to have mortality we're going to have um, dead animals we're going to have to, to deal with. So the best way the poultry industry um, has found that to deal with the, the mortality is composting. And like I said, there is a composting course that all poultry growers must go through. So basically they learn the, the recipe for composting um, 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 the dead that's exiting the house. So this is just um, a composter, typical composter that you would see on a farm. It's just a recipe of layering um, litter, and you're gonna have a bulking agent like um, straw just to kind of keep the, the oxygen going through the compost. Then you'll layer your manure and you'll follow that recipe. And here's another uh, different kind of composter. It's this, um, a channel composter as well. As farms have gotten larger, they have kind of, we've switched to the channel composters, but that's another way that poultry growers are, are handling their dead and manure storage. So every, at the end of the, each flock, a grower has to go in and they're gonna have to remove the crust or the cake. And it's not the yummy cake that we're thinking of, it's the, the litter, the wet litter that has gotten hard and they have to remove that from the house because if they don't, they're gonna have um, high ammonia in the next flocks that's coming in. So they have to remove that wet litter that, in the house and they have to store that in the manure shed until it's time for planting season where they're gonna be able to spread it on the field in um, accordance to their nutrient management plan. So they have um, manure sheds for storage. And Bill and I thought it would be important just to touch on food safety as well as far as the broiler industry. Food safety is a priority for the broiler industry. Um, they, it is a, a concern. They do, obviously, we do not wanna send any um, contaminated product for the consumer to, um, to buy. 
And as Bill mentioned, he touched on the processing plant and it is an engineering marvel. I worked in the processing plant for about a year and there's probably still, there's still things that I haven't figured out as far as processing. There's a lot that goes into it. But as far as food safety, there is a food safety program that has been implemented since probably the mid 90s called the HACCP program. It stands for Hazard analysis critical control point that is the food safety program that is implemented in the processing plants and essentially there is a HACCP person their food safety person that works for the poultry companies that implements this HACCP program and they work in conjunction with the USDA inspectors that are working in the processing plant to make sure that they are producing that product in accordance to their HACCP plan so it's the own the, the poultry company's HACCP plan they put it together and then USDA just looks through it and to make sure that um, yes, it, it's good. But it's, the, it's not USDA's plan, it's the poultry company's plan. So they are the ones that are ensuring the, food, the safety of the product. So I hope I left up enough time for questions. For questions. <laughs> uh, question I would offer, Bill, um, as you pointed out, the poultry house, the, 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 the integral, I'm sorry, the growers, the, the structure of their Businesses have evolved over the years. Way back when, they were all individual family uh, sole proprietorships. Do you have any thought on what the future holds? I know you have a crystal ball. The crystal ball broke many decades ago. <laughs> Is this on? I hope so. Errol, I don't know. We're, I think we're going to continue to see farm families growing chickens. That's, that's the way it's been for 50 years. The first vertically integrated operation, as I mentioned, was Townsend's Incorporated of Millsboro, Delaware in the late 1950s. And we've been in this system since then. It's provided a lot of good incomes for the farm families. It provided consumers with a bountiful, high quality product. It allows the companies to provide advice to make sure that the birds are meeting their standards. And it seems to work. So I think it will continue. Has the amount of phosphorus output increased since 1925, decreased, or is it steadily unchanged? I'm thinking they're, I assume they're asking, is the, is the amount of phosphorus per ton gone up or down in the litter? The question was in relation to, to phytase. And those of you that don't know what phytase is, essentially it's um, the, an enzyme that is added to feed to improve the phosphorus availability in plants. Only about a third of the phosphorus in plants is available for a chicken to utilize, the two-thirds of that is going to be bound to a phytate ring that the digestive system of the chicken is not able to break that phosphorus off and to utilize it. So I believe it's been since the early 2000s that it has been a law to add in phytase or an enzyme similar to phytase to poultry diets in Maryland, but the way the industry has set up as far as uh, integration and there may be a feed mill in Maryland, but they may feed chickens in Delaware. So essentially all of Delmarva is adding this enzyme phytase to improve phosphorus availability. And as far, I don't know the exact numbers, but as far as phosphorus excretion, it, 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 it decreases phosphorus excretion by about, I think 30% um, when you add that, that enzyme to the diet, so it has it decreased as um, far as the phosphorus in the manure. It was the Water Quality Improvement Act of 1998 which required the use of phytase and a lot of the research was done at the University of Maryland College Park, a researcher, Dr. Rosalina Angel, who continues to work looking at phytase in combination with other ingredients to reduce the output of the phosphorus from the birds even further. So we've, we've made great strides and I think we'll continue to make great strides. Uh, <clears throat> Bill, uh, we mentioned hormones. Uh, this questioner wants to know, since no hormones are added to feed, do the birds get hormones by any other means, i.e. water, etc.? No. No hormones are provided by feed, water, vaccination, shots, dropped out of the air, or anything. The only hormones are those naturally occurring in the animal, just as human beings and other species have naturally occurring, occurring hormones. No. Not added any way. Uh, <clears throat> Jennifer, um, you mentioned uh, vegetative buffers, environmental issues. Are there any BMPs on the horizon that you are aware of that the industry may be looking at? New BMPs. Um, I'm not aware of any new BMPs. Are you, Jenny? Phil? 
No, as far as no, I don't think there are any new BMPs. Um, best management practices um, that are on the horizon to be implemented now. Except, Except it's not really a BMP for, for environmental reasons, but the, the better use the birds make of the feed ingredients they are given in converting to meat, the fewer outputs of the rear end of the chicken. So if they do a better job of using the nutrients in producing meat and bones, less coming out the rear end, fewer, ish, fewer byproducts to have to deal with. So there's always research on better efficiency of the feed. Okay. We'll do that. Um, this is on contracts. <clears throat> are, are growers locked into a long-term contract, or can they change companies at will? Uh, Bill? In my 30 years with Delmarva Poultry Industry Incorporated, I have never read a contract. We don't get involved in contractual issues. We have a panel of three growers coming up who can address that issue. But there has been movement from one chicken company to another. I mentioned we have five on Delmarva. That's more than many other areas of the country. So growers over the years have had the latitude and the flexibility. If they don't like the company they're growing with, they can shop around and grow with another company. Similarly, the companies, if they're not happy with the performance of their growers, may say, we're going to give you a, a time to correct your, your, your mistakes, do a better job. If that doesn't work out, you need to find somebody else to grow for. But the specificity of the contracts I cannot talk about because I don't know. Oh. To what extent are farms using waste, in parentheses, poultry litter, to energy to help defray electrical cost? At this point, it is not a common practice to um, utilize poultry litter for energy. At all of the technology that is out there is on a research basis, so it's not um, routinely available for just um, poultry growers to utilize. So it, it's just right now, it's, on a, it's at the research point, so it has not gone to a commercial standpoint. Uh, I have heard that the use of calcium as a food feed additive is on the rise. Is this reducing the P reduction benefits of phytase, the relationship between phytase and, and uh, calcium? Well, phytase, which is the enzyme to improve phosphorus availability, can also improve calcium availability as well because it can bind that phytate ring as well. Increasing, I mean, birds have a, a phosphorus and calcium requirement. They have a nutritional requirement. It's typically two to one, so you need to keep that balance of um, phosphorus to ca uh, calcium in line. So I am not, like, I don't work for the commercial poultry industry, so I'm not sure as far as formulating and uh, adding additional calcium. I don't know if that would do any different. But actually, if you added too much calcium, it's going to have a negative impact on growth. Uh, Bill, I think, I think this is yours. Uh, is resize of the poultry industry on Del Marble limited by processing capacity? Yes. It has been probably close to 40 years since a new processing plant has been built on the Delmarva Peninsula. That would be the Tyson plant at Temperanceville, Virginia. I think it would be very difficult to get a new chicken processing plant permitted, licensed, constructed, and operated. So I don't see any new processing plants being built. Uh, there's a lot of retrofitting, a lot of improvements to the existing facilities, many of which were tomato canneries in the early days. But I don't see any new processing plants being built, and that, yes, will limit how many birds can be grown on the Delmarva Peninsula, because they have to go somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> last question, because we are getting up against the timeline. Uh, is the air, what is the area for greatest, or is there an area for greatest entrepreneurial growth other than actually raising birds? Within the industry, I think that's what the person is asking. Something beyond raising birds, uh, I would add to that because that's one of my interests with uh, small farms is um, value added. You do something with litter, you do something with feathers. Uh, can you, beyond the construction industry, is, do you see a potential for any entrepreneurial spirit in the poultry industry besides raising birds? Didn't we determine my crystal ball was broken? <laughs> there was research a number of years ago about doing something with feathers 
other than what was being done then to make them into some sort of an industrial product. The USDA at Bellsville was doing some yes, of that research. I'm and I, with that. I'm not, I haven't heard of that mentioned in a number of years. It's possible. Uh, the opportunities to produce energy from chicken farms is, is, as Jennifer said, ongoing in the research phase. Uh, there may be better uses for the manure other than uh, energy production or farm fertilizer, extracting the nutrients from the manure and making it a standalone fertilizer product that can be blended with other fertilizer products. We're seeing more and more solar panels being put on poultry farms. That would be another source of income from uh, the farms. Beyond that, I'd have to do some pondering. I don't think we have time for me to ponder. But the, the, to follow up on what you were saying about the feathers, I, I was at, a, at Beltsville in a presentation. They have figured out how to extract, or, or actually to make, use feathers as HEPA filters. But no one's figured out how to manufacture the equipment to make them into HEPA filters. And this researcher was suggesting that if we could figure that out, the value of the feathers would be greater than the value of the chicken. But um, we're out of time. I want to say thank you for Bill and Jennifer, and they'll be around.